to describe the feeling of anticipating a future that's better than the present. You might be giddy or excited or maybe unsure, but most of us know that experience. We call it hope. It's a state of anticipation, and it's crucial for healthy human existence. And it's a really important concept in the Bible. In fact, there are many words for hope in the ancient languages of the Bible, and they're all fascinating. In the Old Testament, there are two main Hebrew words translated as hope. The first is yachal, which means simply to wait for. Like in the story of Noah and the ark, as the flood waters recede, Noah had to yachal for weeks. The other Hebrew word is kava, which also means to wait. It's related to the Hebrew word kav, which means cord. When you pull a kav tight, you produce a state of tension until there's release. That's kava, the feeling of tension and expectation while you wait for something to happen. The prophet Isaiah depicts God as a farmer who plants vines and kavahs for good grapes. Or the prophet Micah talks about farmers who both kava and yachal for morning dew to give moisture to the land. So in biblical Hebrew, hope is about waiting or expectation. But waiting for what? In the period of Israel's prophets, as the nation was sinking into self-destruction, Isaiah said, at this moment, the Lord's hiding his face from Israel, so I will kava for him. The only hope Isaiah had in those dark days was the hope for God himself. You find the same notion of hope all over the book of Psalms, where these words appear over 40 times. In almost every case, what people are waiting for is God. Like in Psalm 130, the poet cries out from a pit of despair, I kava for the Lord, let Israel yachal for the Lord, because he's loyal and will redeem Israel from its sins. Biblical hope is based on a person, which makes it different from optimism. Optimism is about choosing to see in any situation how circumstances could work out for the best. But biblical hope is not focused on circumstances. In fact, hopeful people in the Bible often recognize there's no evidence things will get better but you choose hope anyway. Like the prophet Hosea, he lived in a dark time when Israel was being oppressed by foreign empires and he chose hope when he said God could turn this valley of trouble into a door of hope, like the day when Israel came up from the land of Egypt. God had surprised his people with redemption back in the days of the Exodus and he could do so again. So it's God's past faithfulness that motivates hope for the future. You look forward by looking backward, trusting in nothing other than God's character. It's like the poet of Psalm 39 who says, And now, O Lord, what else can I kava for? You are my yachal. In the New Testament, the earliest followers of Jesus cultivated the similar habit of hope. They believe that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was God's surprising response to our slavery to evil and death. The empty tomb opened up a new door of hope, and they used the Greek word elpis to describe this anticipation. The apostle Peter said that Jesus' resurrection opened up a living hope, that people can be reborn, to become new and different kinds of humans. More than once, the Apostle Paul says the good news about Jesus announces the El Peace of glory. In both cases, this El Peace is based on a person, the risen Jesus who has overcome death. And this hope wasn't just for humans. The Apostles believed that what happened to Jesus in the resurrection was a foretaste of what God had planned for the whole universe. In Paul's words, it's a hope that creation itself will be liberated from slavery to corruption into freedom when God's children are glorified. So Christian hope is bold, waiting for humanity and the whole universe to be rescued from evil and death. And some would say it's crazy, and maybe it is. But biblical hope isn't optimism based on the odds. It's a choice to wait for God to bring about a future that's as surprising as a crucified man rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Jesus in order to look forward. And so we wait. That's what the biblical words for hope are all about. So again, so three words that we're going to look at today is hope, waiting, and then, of course, tension. Because anytime you hope, there is a sense of tension when we get our expectations up. We are ripe to have them met or ripe maybe for disappointment or discouragement. So we're going to live in that space this morning for a few minutes together. And I genuinely believe that the Lord wants to minister healing to some of our hearts or some, some of, specifically in the area where we have had hope and we have not yet seen Jesus do what it is that we are asking him to do. There's this, there's a place, I, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, whether it's talking about revival or God moving and all of those things. And how many of you know that God is always moving? Revival, however, is an intensification of what the Holy Spirit is always doing. 
So it's what he does in ones and twos, he begins to do in fifties and hundreds, but it's that he's always consistently moving. It's, a, it's the idea that God is always present, but there are these theophanies, there are these close to moments in God that are just different. It's the same idea of a God who is everywhere, everywhere but still can hide. And he says, seek after me and search me. And so there are some paradoxes that we're gonna play with this morning, but hopefully healing can come to your heart. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, if you've been to a wedding, you've heard this a million times. So now faith, hope, everyone say hope. So faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And so the greatest is love. And Hebrews 11 talk, or Hebrews 6, sorry, talks about you and I, that without faith, it's not possible to please God. And it seems that we've got a lot of conversation around love and a lot around faith, but not as much around hope. And in 2019, we need hope. But what type of hope is absolutely critical? In the church, oftentimes we use hype when we should be using hope. And hype is emotional, you know, gets our emotions driven up. It gets all those things. But sometimes it, it, it's not rooted in the right thing. It's not anchored properly. And so it sets us up again to be disappointed. So what about hope? Well, just as we saw just a moment ago, it's all through the scriptures. And this morning, there's really two ways that we want to talk about hope. One is it's waiting for, it's looking forward. You know, for example, you on tomorrow morning, many of you are going to be standing, waiting for your white and red limousine to bring you to work. <laughs> your limo just happens to be a really big limo that you get to ride with a lot of people. Um, but you're going to be waiting. You are going to be hoping it shows up on time. And we are believing Jesus one day to have a train in Ottawa. One day it may happen. I, I don't have high hopes, but I, ha I have some hope. Um, but that's when you're waiting for something, okay? So there's one way we can look. It's a very easy way that we're waiting for. Now, that's a very elementary understanding of waiting for. We can elevate at one more level that we are, you know, waiting or hoping for. We are waiting for um, this person that we want to bring into our lives to 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 be a spouse, we can be waiting for our kids to come to know Christ or to grow up or to grow out of that season or whatever it happens to be. If you're here and your kids, you can be waiting for your parents to finally get it. So we can all be waiting for and hoping for, but, but there's a vulnerability in only understanding hope looking forward. Because oftentimes our hope is tied to a singular outcome. And so there's a vulnerability, there's an inherent vulnerability, but there's also a way that was alluded to in the video that we want to talk about today, that there's not only a waiting for, there's also a waiting on. And you have probably have all experienced it. If you've ever been to a restaurant where someone came and took your order and brought you the food and took your plates away, you have been served, you have been waited on. It is something, that, again, that they listen to you and hopefully they go back, they go away from you and they bring you the food that you ordered. Now, I know you don't always get the food you ordered, but hopefully you do. And so there is this place of learning how to wait on the Lord, not just for the Lord, but to wait on the Lord. There's an understanding of hope that we're hoping for God to do something in the future, but we're also in the present tense saying, God, looking at what you have done, I am trusting in you in this moment. So whatever's going on in my life, I am learning to wait on you. I'm waiting to serve you, to engage in this. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his grace, Great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Everyone say a living hope. Amen. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So what Peter does is, again, as we just saw in the video, he says that you and I are born again. That's something that we cannot do for ourselves. It is this living hope. But then notice he doesn't tie it forward. He doesn't tie it into the return of Christ. or He doesn't tie it to what God will do one day. No, a living hope is actually not future forward looking. A living hope is anchored in what Jesus has already done. So a living hope as followers of Christ is not just looking forward, it's learning how to look back to see how God has been faithful in your life, been faithful over the course of our lives. And in that, we receive something that's different than just an emotional hype or an emotional hope. So if Peter is talking here about a living hope, then we have to ask, what's a, a dead hope? Well, a dead hope is obviously the opposite of a living hope. But it is one that is only rooted in optimism. 
nothing wrong with being optimistic. The, the, the end goal today is not that you leave the service being pessimistic. That's not the heart at all. Some of you don't need to be encouraged to do that. You do it naturally. It's just a gift that you have. We are blessed by you. It's just that you just, you just wake up and some people are generous. I'm just gifted with pessimism. That's just how God's made me. You know, some of you, some of you don't see the glass as half full or half empty. You just see the dirt on the glass. That's just <laughs> your gift. It's who you are. And, and we thank you. We thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jeff Hillier. And if you want to email me your gift, it's jhillier at communitypentecostalchurch.com. And I'd be grateful to hear about your, your pessimism, what you want to see this morning. So there's a dead hope. There's a, some of you, that's, that's, that is, no, that's not my name. There is this dead hope, okay, that's rooted in optimism or a singular outcome which only has a fixed forward perspective. Something like, I was hoping to get the job, but then so and so got it. Or I was hoping, this is this, this one, we all experience. I was hoping for God to heal and they died. Or I was hoping Man, I was hoping for them to respond this way, but they responded that way. It's not how I saw that going. And when that happens, often our hope can feel dashed or disappointed. That if our hope is only future focused, fixed on a single outcome, I'm not talking this morning about goals and vision and all those things. I'm talking about the inner space of our heart, of our hope is that when it's only fixed future forward and it's not being held in tension by looking at properly how to look back and then from looking back how to look forward, we are ripe, we are ripe for wounding and for offense. We are ripe for our spiritual enemy to make a mess of our hearts. You know, I don't, know a ton, I don't proclaim to know a ton about bullying, but this I know. That the power of a bully is that they only have to hit you really hard one time. Or they only have to hurt you deeply one time. And then forward, they can use that moment and the threat of that moment to bring fear and uncertainty to your heart. Some of you have experienced that in just a very practical way. And Jesus needs to continue, if he hasn't yet, bring healing to those areas. I don't jump in there and play around for for no reason. But some of you also experience that from your spiritual enemy. Like I made mention of just a moment ago that you have prayed for somebody and they have died. And so now you live as a follower of Christ, never wanting to get your heart broken, which means that you never get your hope up. And if the enemy can cause you to live without hope, then really it is this just everything then is just grit your teeth and get through it. Or it could have been a different space. Is I tried giving for a month and it didn't work. I hoped that I would put 10 bucks in the offering and God would shower down a thousand. And it didn't work. All I was was minus 10 bucks. (laughs) Don't you notice a lot of TV giving is based on manipulation and hype? Church, can I just tell you something just point blank and blunt? You don't have to buy blessing from God, okay? Don't don't get suckered into that nonsense. All right, and we are... Okay, while we're here, let's just stay here. We are going to go into election season here. Um, Don Hutchinson's been greatly helpful with this. Life Center is unapologetically political. And what I mean by that is Canadians, we're absolutely engaged in a political process. But at Life Center, we're not partisan, which means that there are people, okay, take a deep breath here. There are people in this room who will vote for all parties. Turn the person beside you and go, well, you better vote for the one I'm voting for. (laughs) No, no, but we're not partisan. We're not here to be partisan, but we're here to talk about things that matter, but we're not here to be partisan. And so again, we look not to the house of commons for salvation, and we look to the house of the Lord for salvation. We look to what Jesus is doing. 
yet we engage in a process because as Canadians we care about various things and, and that's an important thing to do. But at Life Center, we're not partisan. We're not going to talk about one party or this or that. We're not going to do that. We're going to talk about every one of us engage. Okay, so that was an election pre-speech coming up. I don't know where it came from, but there it was. Um, but it is important to look at. So again, all of us in our lives experience disappointment. All of, us, all of us in our lives, there's not one follower of Jesus who doesn't have to deal with disappointment. There's not one follower of Jesus who wanted God to do this and seemingly he was silent or wanted God to do that, but he didn't do that. It seemed like he did the opposite of that. And there's not one of us that doesn't go through disappointments and faith is not being ignorant of the disappointment. Faith is not saying, that didn't hurt, that didn't hurt, that didn't hurt, that didn't hurt. That's not faith, that's foolishness. Faith is saying that hurt, yet I am trusting you, God, to bring healing to the hurt. It's not living delusional. It's saying, God, I'm anchoring my heart. So again, so if we're only looking at it future forward, we're vulnerable. And so what the scriptures are talking about is for you and I not to exclude looking forward, not to ask God for great things, not to trust him to do the impossible, not to take a step of faith and do what we can do, trusting God to do what only he can do. No, no, that's all a part of faith. That's all a part of growing in Jesus, absolutely. However, if your faith is only rooted in a single outcome that is future, in other words, that has not yet happened, that's the place of vulnerability. And so what Peter is saying and what the gospel understanding of hope is, is actually root your faith in what Jesus has already done, already accomplished. When he points back to the resurrection of Jesus, if you root your faith there, then as the scriptures are going to talk about in a moment, that you have this anchor for your soul and from who God is, God, I trust you to do, not God, in order for you to prove to you, to me who you are, therefore you must do, Jesus fully proved who he was. And from this place, we anchor our hearts. Why is it important to anchor your heart in the resurrection? Why don't we anchor it just in the Sermon on the Mount? Why don't we anchor it just in the great teaching? Well, we don't. We anchor it in the resurrection because the resurrection proved who Jesus was. It, it actually had validity to everything that he said, everything that he said that he was. And so we root ourselves in a finished work because when we are dreaming and hoping and desiring for things that are come that are unfinished, we need to do it from a place of a sure foundation, not an insecure desire. It's a, just a different way in which we look at hope. It's, if, if you're here and you're new to church, you're like, that sounds a little bit peculiar. Well, we are peculiar people because we don't root our faith in a something. We root our faith in a someone. And that's a little bit different to be a follower of Jesus. It doesn't mean that we're immune then to the tough times in life and the good times in life and the times where our hope is met and the times where our hope is disappointed. It simply means that the foundation is different, that you can be devastated. I can be crushed, but I'm not done. I can be overwhelmed, but the anchor still holds. Right? I can be battered, but I'm still standing. Right? It's just a different place. It's this, it's this rootedness place that is absolutely different. And so here's what, the, if we let Peter continue, this is what it says in 1 Peter 3, or chapter 1, I should say, verses 3 to 9. Blessed be God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. We've already read this. According to his great mercy, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. Everyone say an inheritance. An inheritance, of course, is that which is rightfully yours as a follower of Christ. That is, now here's, watch these words. That is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, everyone say God's power. Not by your willpower, not by your optimism alone, not by you conjuring up optimistic thoughts. Nothing wrong with that, but it's, it's not held by that. It's held by God's power. Our being guard, or guard, excuse me, through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved. Now Peter's going to begin to lean in here. You've been grieved by various trials. By a show of hands here, anyone ever experienced disappointment? Can I see your hands, please? 
If not, we got to find out what you is doing. You've been grieved. So this is Peter leaning right in. I know, I know. He's talking to the early church. Put yourself in their shoes. Where it wasn't just their rights that were being trampled. They were being slaughtered. They were some instances where prison doors were opened. And people were set free. And others where they were absolutely kept shut. And people lost their lives. Martyrs for following Jesus. He's leaning in here. You've been grieved by various trials that the tested genuineness of your faith. How many know that our faith is tested? That the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and honor and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, at the revelation of who Jesus is, the reality of everything that Jesus has done, not just a future-focused outcome. Then he says, though you have not seen him, you have loved him. Though you do not know him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible, filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So a living hope is you and I as followers of Jesus, not only having optimistic hearts or not only focusing forward, not only trusting and hoping and desiring for God to do these good things. There's nothing wrong with that. That's one side of the equation. But the other side is that you and I also train ourselves in trials and tribulations and struggles and when we're disappointed and when we're discouraged and when it seems as though your dream has died and when it seems as though your dream is dashed, in that moment, it doesn't help to keep looking forward you got to learn yourself you got to train yourself to also look back to what Jesus who Jesus is and what Jesus has done because if you only keep staying in that space then it's hard to have the heart to trust again but when you look back to who Jesus was then you and I then you and I can say well God if you were faithful there and you were faithful there and you were faithful there and you were faithful to do this and you were faithful to do this and you were faithful to do this and if you were faithful to do all of these things including raising your son from the dead then God I'm going to root myself in a finished work of the cross not the unfinished work of the present do you get it it's not an either or it's just knowing in what season you're in, where do you need to root your heart? God's past faithfulness motivates our hope for the future. That God's past faithfulness, it's learning how to look back. And some of you can also do this looking back and look back at the faithfulness of God in your own life. Because in a trial, that's what we quickly forget. This is overwhelming. This is what I'm going through is overwhelming. This current present season is overwhelming. It's all that I can see. The circumstances, they're all of those things. And that is so true. And sometimes we can't see forward because of the circumstance. Anybody here ever wake up with a cloudy heart? Don't trust your heart. You're not seeing things right. It's hard to have hope and optimism. So here's the danger if we don't train ourselves as a church to look back. Here's the danger is in this place we will exchange hope for hype because it's easier. We will continue just to try to pull on the next emotion or put that next worship song on just to kind of shake that off. And sometimes, yeah, you got to shake it off. Shake, shake, shake it off. Thank you, T-Swizzle. But other times, other times, you don't need to shake it off. You need to look back and trust Jesus to shake something off of your life. It's not hype and just pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It is hope saying, God, I am trusting you to do not only in my life in the future, but I thank you for what you have already done in my heart. One of the most amazing supernatural things you can do in the midst of a trial is to express worship of gratitude to who God is. In some of the deepest, most profound moments of pain where you feel like something is broken, Father, I thank you that you are a God of reconciliation. I thank you were a God who can do all things and bring them 
together because, Lord, when I look at the scriptures and I see what you did in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, what you did in Esther's life, what you did in David's life when he didn't deserve it, what you did in Jacob's life when he was a swindler, God, when I look at what you did all through history, when I look at you through the prophet Hosea and Isaiah and Jeremiah, God, when I look at what you did in you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when I look at what you did in Esther's life, when I look at what you did in my great-grandmother's life, when I look at what you did in my grandfather's life, when I look at what you did in Mother Teresa's life and Dr. King's life, God, when I look at what you did, you are faithful. Because if we as a church don't learn to do that, then we define everything by our present circumstance and not the cross of Christ not the finished work of Jesus, you will define your faith and you will define who God is based on your experience rather than whoever God, forever who God has established him to be, whether you see it or not. There have been many generations who have prayed for what God is doing today and they didn't see it, but they saw it, but didn't see it. There's this tenacity of faith of learning to look back at the faithfulness of God and especially in a trial, especially when you're disappointed or discouraged. As I made reference to a moment ago, Hebrews chapter six, verses 19 to 20 says, then we have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope. Everyone say a hope. It says that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And if you want to learn what that means, come to Bible school. First service laughed a little harder there, I'm going to admit. Not that it's a competition, but they did. What is Hebrew writer, maybe Paul, but what, what are they driving at? right here, that you and I have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place. They're actually now talking now back to the Old Testament. There used to be a, uh, a temple that Israel would go to once a year. There was an outer court, an inner court, and then there was Holy of Holy where the high priest could only go once a year to make atonement for the sins of the people. And that was, again, accessed by one individual at one time a year. When Jesus died, the veil in this Holy of Holies was rent from top to bottom, which means what Peter is, or the writer, writer of Hebrews is expressing here is that you and I have access to the person of Jesus, the presence of the Holy Spirit, that you as a follower of Jesus have this anchor for your soul in the midst of every season and any season of life that you don't have to stay on the outer courts you don't just have to wave at God from a distance that you can engage God with your whole heart not because you're all that in a bag of chicks not because in 2019 you have a cell phone that connects to the internet and we're so advanced no 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 none of those things because in all of those things we are worthless but because of the worth of Jesus Christ because of what he has done and he has done alone you and I have access to the Father. We have access to the fullness of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Imagine, I want you to imagine the disciples for a moment. I want you to imagine them walking with Jesus. And if their heart, Jesus was training them the whole time, don't just have your heart on a singular outcome. Have it rooted in me. And that was a journey for them. And I want you to imagine them for a moment. I'll step over right here. I want you to imagine them for a moment walking with Jesus, seeing the miracles, seeing all the astounding things that he is doing, and then their hope begins to engage. It begins to rise up. And then I want you to imagine them having a final meal together. And over and over and over again, he's been saying, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And they're like, ah, miracles, ah, miracles, ah, miracles. And then they see Jesus arrested. And then there's this moment where for them it feels like hope is, is being taken away. But they've seen Jesus heal the sick and they've seen him do extraordinary supernatural things. So maybe their hearts are just hoping he's going to get out of this. And again, as the writer in Hebrew says, for the joy set before him, he endures the cross. Not, there's no joy in the anguish and the pain of it, but what it could per purchase and provide for you and I is absolutely critical. Could you imagine the disciples as they watched Jesus die? That's not the outcome they would have been looking for. 
take the person who's writing some of these texts, Peter, who hoped that he would be stronger than this season, the season showed that he was. He hoped in himself, though everybody betrays you, not me. And Jesus said, ah, you, you're not just going to betray me once, you're going to betray me three times. Turn the person beside you and you go, that's a word of encouragement. <laughs> Who wants that prophetic word? The Lord has said, you're, ah, I'm not coming to that service anymore. It's terrible. I'm going to the one where they tell me I'm going to get rich. <laughs> naughty, naughty, naughty. Jesus dies. And we know three days later, we, know, we get it. We, we've, we, it. It's hard to read the scriptures because we know the ends of the stories, but they didn't. Yeah. It's like looking at your Aunt Edna who tells you the whole story. In, well, it's your Aunt Edna, so it takes about an hour. <laughs> right? But she's condensing maybe 15, 18 years of journey into a snap bite. But I can just imagine the disciples. Three days pass. They're still sulking, as they should have been, mourning, grieving. Some women go to the tomb, and they hear that Jesus is alive, but they don't believe the women. As much as things have changed, they haven't changed that much. Men got to see it for themselves, or it didn't happen. Right? And then all of a sudden, it's Jesus is alive. And the hope that was rooted in an outcome, now it begins to be rooted not in a something, but a someone. But it's not done yet. Because, I mean, the worst someone can do to you is kill you. Right? It's the worst. And Rome has done that to Jesus, and Jesus has overcome. So now they're thinking, Rome, you're going to get it. And Rome is going to get it. But it's not going to be through force. It's going to be through serving and love. It's different. And Jesus is walking with them, and they're loving life again. And then Jesus turns and says, I'm going to go. And they say, no, don't leave. He says, no, it's better that I go than I can send the Holy Spirit. Jesus was teaching and training his disciples all along. Place your faith in me, not only in what you see that I'm doing. Sometimes I'm doing things that you can't see as high as that are from the earth. So are my ways from your ways. Anybody here go through a season and say, God, I don't know what you're doing. In that place where you can't see forward, you need to have the courage to look back to what Jesus has done. Well, God, you were faithful there. God, you were faithful there. God, your name is faithful and you will be true. So we train ourselves to do both. In a trial, when you don't see the outcome or it's hard to see that God is moving, look back. Look back to his faithfulness in future generations, or sorry, past generations. Look back to what he's done in your heart and life. And in doing so, he may calm the storm or he may calm you in the midst of the storm. And both and both are tremendous miracles. 